Hello and welcome to Photographic Connections, the podcast where we create connection to self, nature and others through the art of photography. My name is Kim Grant, the founder of Photographic Connections and your host for this podcast. And today I'm absolutely delighted to welcome Jennifer Walton onto the podcast. Jennifer is a storm chaser based in America who uses photography as a way of documenting the incredible storms that she chases around the country. We speak about what got her into storm chasing in the first place, the power that limiting beliefs has on holding us back in life when pursuing our dreams and the importance of following our joy. Jen also shares the incredibly inspiring story about why she started an initiative called Girls Who Chase, which has gone on to receive global recognition and led her to become an advocate in inspiring others to follow their dreams. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Jennifer Walton. Hi, Jen. Thank you so much for coming on to the podcast this week. Before we we begin, I must say a huge thank you to our listeners as one of them suggested you on Instagram the other week. And upon seeing your work, I was just completely blown away with what you do. I think it's absolutely mind blowing and incredible. And I'm so looking forward to to chatting with you today and and, and unearthing your story, really. But before we kind of get into the, the nitty gritty of it all, I wondered if you could go way back to the beginning and explain what got you into photography in the first place. Storm chasing got me into photography, actually. And um, thank you very much for having me as well. And thank you uh, to my dear friend on Instagram who recommended me for this podcast. Um, Yeah, it's, it's kind of weird, actually, because I've probably had an eye for photography my whole life. I feel like I can look back at times when I would set up compositions in my mind, like looking at places. Um, but I never really translated that directly to a camera or to, to capturing it physically until I started storm chasing. And someone finally, after about three years of me posting photos said, I have no idea why you don't have a camera. And I said, you know what? You're right. I don't know why I don't have a camera. It's probably time. So I added that to the repertoire to kind of make it official at that point. Mm. It's really interesting because it says on on your website that you didn't start chasing storms until you were around 40 years old because of kind of limiting beliefs and stuff that you had. I I wondered if you could go a little bit into that because I think it might be quite inspirational for anybody out there who has these dreams or these goals or these things they want to do. But for one reason or another, they have these beliefs that are holding them back. What was your kind of story around that? That's absolutely true. And I think the key with those is like the first step is admitting you have a problem, essentially. And it took a while for me to even realize I was having that thought process. I think that's the most difficult piece of it. And there's a lot of different elements that that go into what I think was stopping me from starting to do the thing that I love. And it was a combination of Um, I mean, storm chasing is not a career unless you're really aggressively producing content and chasing every day. And it can be done. And there are folks out there who do it and do it well. I don't want to live that lifestyle. I don't even know if I could at this point because I'm just tired all the time anyway. Um, But so I think for that reason and, and having been brought up with you go get a career, you get a skill, you, you know, you develop a trade that you're excellent at. You do that to make money and pay your bills and kind of a work hard now, play hard later mentality. And so I think for a long time that, that translated for me to, I shouldn't be bothering or getting into the things that would never translate to on paper, what would make a career. And So that was kind of piece one. I think piece two was I thought that you had to be a degreed meteorologist to storm chase. I thought you had to be deep into the science, um, that a significant amount of education was necessary. Uh, And then there was the danger component to it where I felt as though, okay, I obviously need to go out with someone who knows what they're doing. I have no business being out there right without a clue. And then I think the last piece of it and the piece that really is the underpinning of the story of Girls Who Chase was 
when I look back at all my media consumption of severe weather, whether it was like watching a weather network on television or um, watching reality TV shows like Storm Chasers, um, there really weren't any women on, on air. And there were really no women in those shows. And if there were women, they were kind of a token along for the ride type personality where they weren't really contributing to decision making or participating in an active way. And I don't think it was a conscious decision, but somewhere along the way that for me translated to, I guess I don't belong here. Like it, I could not put myself in the shoes of someone who storm chased um, because I couldn't, I wasn't seeing anyone on TV who looked like me. So um, I think all of those pieces woven together created a, I can't do this story. And um, I finally caught myself for the first time in 2018, which is why I started chasing in 2018, saying to myself, I can't do this. I actually found a discount for a storm chasing tour. Those are a thing. Um, on social media following some chaser I had been following because I was consuming that content. And I, I literally thought to myself, well, I can't do that. And then I thought, why can't I? <laughs> Where's that coming from? Um, and how long have I been telling myself that? Here is this way for me to dip a toe in the water with experts where I clearly feel as though I am not one of those. And... I was in a position, uh, luckily, working full time at the time where I could afford something like that. And so what is stopping me from doing this? So that to me, I think was the, the pivotal moment really that has kind of brought about this next chapter of my life, where essentially I went on the tour, we saw almost nothing because it was a quiet season. Um, but I spent seven days asking why? <laughs> like, I was like totally nerding out. I had a little notebook um, and was just taking notes. Anytime anybody would talk about forecasting or positioning or decision making, one day we were sitting at a gas station and a storm formed over the gas station. And I was like, hold the phone. This is amazing. How did you guys know this was going to happen? Oh my gosh. And so I think, you know, the rest of the tour guests were there. Um, you know, for the adrenaline and, and to see a storm. And not that I wasn't, um, but it turned out I was really there to get my foundation. And I think the tour guides were just jazzed by how fascinated I was and how, how many questions I was asking. They were wonderful um, about answering them. And then I got home from the tour and said, I, I feel like I learned just enough to be dangerous, pun intended. Like I learned enough on the tour to realize I can teach myself to forecast. I can actually get out there and start storm chasing. And the only thing that's been stopping me is me. So that was, that was kind of that pivotal transition point. Wow. There's so much in that, Jen. And I love that you said there at the end, the only thing that was stopping me was me. And, you know, in, in so many situations in life, it's so true. You know, we, we we all have our own stories and our own backgrounds and our own beliefs that we we get throughout the years. And, but, you know, I think when we have this passion deep inside of us, it'll niggle away at us for years and years and years until something will happen and we'll just crack and we'll just be like, I have to to, to look into this and experience it. And you definitely, you definitely had that with, with your experience there. And I think it's beautiful that you went out there and you, you did this, this tour and it just gave you, you were like, I need to, to learn to do this and, and continue to do it. And you just, you can feel the, the awe and the wonder that storm chasing brings you. And you said there that, that you watched quite a lot of, you know, these reality TV programs and whatnot about storm chasing, but have you ever um, uncovered, I guess, where your, pa where your interest in it actually started? You know, were you interested in the weather as a child or, or where did it begin? It began with sheer terror. <laughs> um, so I guess I could say I was interested, but not in a like 
great, positive, yay weather kind of way. And it's interesting, I've discovered now over time that that's actually shared, that storyline is shared by a lot of other storm chasers. And I think that's really when people decide whether they're into the weather or not, if they can translate that terror into fascination. And I, I don't remember the transition point when I was little, little, uh, there would be, I grew up in, in the Southeast US and there were nighttime thunderstorms all the time. And I would drag my sleeping bag into my parents' bedroom because I would, they scared me. Nighttime thunder, I mean, actually nighttime thunderstorms still scare me sometimes. <laughs> um, and at some point I started watching the weather channel here, which was brand new. It was a 24 seven weather coverage channel. And they really didn't have a lot of content. It was mostly just the weather forecast over and over and over. And my parents would turn the television on and instead of it being tuned to like a cartoon channel or something, it would be on the weather channel. And, um, and then I started staring out the window at stuff. Like it just kind of turned into, I want to see more of this all the time. And that was pretty much where it stayed for a very long time. Um, I think just because again, I had told myself over and over, this isn't, I won't be doing this. This is kind of a side fascination. I'll just go look at pictures of tornadoes. And even more interestingly, my entire career and background is in the sciences. My expertise is in science and climate change communication. So I was one degree removed and in some cases, no degrees removed from severe weather researchers and people doing field work around severe weather and spent years and years and years trying to get them to take me out with them chasing again, thinking I needed to go with an expert. Um, and so there isn't, I, I don't have that one storm per se. I mean, I think, um, you know, shortly after I got back from the tour, uh, I live in Denver, Colorado, which is kind of on the fringe of what I would you would call t traditional tornado alley in the United States. I saw a storm come out of the foothills here and went after it. Um, and it ended up producing a tornado, which became my first tornado. Um, and I think that was probably my moment, even more so on top of the realizing, you know, I had been telling myself a story. Um, it just created a monster that day. You know, like I had, I had learned just enough to know what, a, a rotating storm would look like on radar and um, just enough to kind of know how to keep after it. But I was on the wrong side of the storm and I drove through, got stuck in traffic. Like I made all of these kind of rookie mistakes and I had been such a rush to get out of my house um, to get after the storm that I was still wearing my pajamas. <laughs> so it was just a mess. Um, but man, I crested a hill and in front of me was that tornado. And I was like, sign me up. Like, this is it, you know? Um, so it was kind of a delayed, uh, this is for me moment um, that just, I think, escalated over time and was exacerbated by proximity <laughs> to what I thought I could have. And I kept saying for years and years, this is the other piece of the irony, I guess, um, that my dream job would be doing communication about severe weather. Um, in a way that would get me out into the field. And there are a very few of those types of jobs. They never turn over. Um, and generally, they're based in Oklahoma, where I refuse to live. And so um, I just figured this is just never going to happen. And then I ended up essentially creating that job through Girls Who Chase. Um, so it's weird how life works that way. It's amazing. I, I love your story there. I think in many ways it resonates with mine, not, not the storm chasing side of things. You know, we don't really get, as, as I'm sure you're aware, these incredible, crazy storms here in, in Scotland. We might just get the odd lightning storm, but that's about it. Um, but it's like with me, it was like I kind of realised what I kind of wanted to do, but I didn't really know how to go about it. There was no jobs coming up there in that sort of area. And I kind of realised if I wanted to do the sort of things I was thinking I wanted to do, I'd probably have to move to a big city like London, which I was like, there's no way I'm doing that. I want to be, you know, in nature. 
So again, it's like going in and creating that job for yourself. And I think that's a really powerful thing to share because I think especially nowadays with the power of social media and writing and all that other kind of stuff, you know, we we can literally create jobs for ourselves. And there's always going to be people out there who are interested. If we're really passionate about something, there's always going to be people out there who are interested in, in what we're you know, what we're passionate about and what we're we're going out there to, to pursue. And you've mentioned a few times there about girls who chase. So I'm obviously aware of this because I've looked into it. But for those listening, I wondered mm-hmm. if you could explain a little bit, you know, what is girls who chase? Absolutely. Um, and I just I, I want to go back to the creating your own job uh, just momentarily, because those of us who have gotten into personal growth work, um, over the course of life. And I think it, it gets more and more prevalent as you age, um, because your priorities start to change (laughs) in a lot of different ways. What I kept reading over and over in the narrative of those, uh, various authors and thought leaders was it's all about figuring out what is this, what is your why? What is the thing that lights you up? And, I think a lot of people know what that why is, but they cannot for the life of them figure out how to translate that into everyday life or a trade. And that was obviously the case. I mean, to me, storm chasing is not a career. It's just not a legitimate, right? Um, And yet going through this process and the birth of Girls Who Chase was literally about following my joy. Um, And... I had a job, I was doing what I needed to, to pay the bills while also pursuing this thing on the side. Girls Who Chase was literally born out of me going through that process. And so I think like ab- absolutely if you look at this from a logical linear perspective, it doesn't make a lot of sense. And yet I am a, a case in point for how this all can fall out if you do truly figure out that thing and do what you need to to put yourself in that space whatever that looks like so i i just kind of wanted to tie those pieces together (laughs) um so girls who chase uh so i mentioned that i i've had a long background and career in the sciences and um the cultural environment in the sciences is characterized Um, not holistically, but in general, by um, gender disparity, instances of misogyny. Women have been struggling for years to be treated as equals to their male counterparts. And I witnessed and experienced some of that myself as in my jobs, my various jobs um, throughout the years. And so when I started storm chasing, which to me is kind of an extension of the sciences, I assumed I would encounter a similar environment. And I did not um, in, in the sense that, you know, in general, I would say the environment in the sciences is perpetuated by the people who benefit from it most, <laughs> which is men. Um, and that, again, is not wholly across the board, but generally the case and research has found that to be true. Um, in storm chasing, I encountered kind, wonderful, supportive men who really didn't think twice about the fact that I was there. They weren't threatened by female storm chasers. Like that just was not, it didn't exist, um, at least in my experience. Um, Not only that, but they went out of their way to boost and support us um, and me as I was growing as a chaser. Um, And yet, what I was seeing manifest um, in a lot of different ways was, was the same. And so it was confusing for me. And what I mean by that is when I was following all of the chasers and watching the reality shows and all that kind of stuff, I just was not seeing much content from women. And at that point, I had you know figured out who was who on social media and um, figured out who was a good educator and was, you know, digging, digging for gr- great articles and other ways to learn about chasing. And so I had kind of, you know, using my communications acumen, found who I needed to find, basically, to, to get the resources I needed. And yet I, I really only had found a few women. And so that was weird. Um, and then as I started chasing and made chase friends, 
Most of my chase friends were men because that's who was storm chasing. Um, and what we noticed over time was that, you know, all other things being equal, for example, we would go out on a chase and post content and my chase, my male chase friends would get patted on the back and told how awesome they were and their content would sell immediately and people would come around waving money and all that kind of stuff. And I would just get crickets. Um, and it was, you know, initially, of course, you can say, well, I just suck at this, right? Like I just started, I need to get better at content production. But two, three years later, this is still happening. And the the chasers that I was with at the time had the same amount of experience. They were on the same storm. Our stuff looked exactly the same. Um, and then I started speaking with other female chasers who reflected a similar experience and uh, in different ways. Um, and so it, it had became clear after a while that this was, there was an issue here essentially. And again, because it wasn't manifesting the same exact way as it did in the sciences where there was a very apparent source, um, it was really hard to figure out what was causing this. And so this became a cyclic pattern where I would chase with somebody, we would post content, he would do great, I would get crickets, and every, each time I got a little more frustrated. Um, and then we started to kind of run these social experiments where I would post content and he wouldn't. And then I would make sales. Then the people would come around. Then the accolades would start. And it was like, okay. So clearly we're assuming that I'm just along for the ride. He got me there, right? When in many cases it was actually the opposite. Um, I was the one doing the forecasting and targeting, you know, and he just was white. Right? We were equals in every sense of the word. Um, but there was this kind of cultural assumption. And so uh, it kept kind of pushing me further and further over the edge each time it would happen. And my friends would say, do something. Like, do something about this if it's bothering you so much, right? You, obviously, you're frustrated. And I would say, well, I am not the one. I'm too new. I'm too, right? Like, this, this, this needs to get handled by a female chaser who's been doing this for 20 years, like I'm, I just showed up, you know? Um, and eventually I just snapped one time and I don't remember what it was that put me over the edge, but um, I said, that's it, I've had it, you know, I'm gonna launch an Instagram page that showcases female storm chasing talent um, because I'm tired of insisting that we produce amazing content and everyone's stuff is just as good, but there's really no way to showcase that, right? You have social media feeds, you post a photo, it immediately disappears down a feed. Um, and Instagram is an aggregator where we can start to kind of show and not tell. So I kind of just hauled off and launched this Instagram page called Girls Who Chase and um, was almost immediately blown away by the response. Um, and what I mean by that is um, the Chase community was thrilled um, and was kind of boosting it and sharing word, but then multiple concentric circles outside of the Chase community were also similarly thrilled. So weather enthusiasts and then um, academia found it and kind of caught on. I started getting letters from um, like a, the, one of the earliest ones was a sixth grade science teacher who said, I'm showing this page to my class because I think weather is a great entree into science. And I want the girls in my class to know that girls can do anything. And here's an example. <laughs> um, and so stuff kept happening where I was like, I would get blown away or it would kind of make me cry or, and it was very clear that there was something going on here that was not just an Instagram page. Um, and then I started getting submissions from uh, women storm chasing globally. So we are now at 15 countries and counting um, that are represented. And Every time I would get something from someone, often it would be accompanied by a note saying, 
I've been searching for years for a community I felt like I belonged to. You've created a community that I feel like I'm a part of and that I'm so proud of to be a part of. And so this kind of continued and then eventually the media coverage started. Um, I mean, at that point, when our first article went, it was just an Instagram page. <laughs> so this was March 2022, I think, timing wise. And we had just started to launch some of that content, the additional media content. Um, and it just escalated from there and it hasn't stopped. Like that's the weird thing also is that sometimes when stuff go, goes kind of crazy in the media, you get this very brief burst of coverage and then it just sort of disappears into the ether. And this has just slow burned in a continuous and consecutively larger way over time. So because of all of these things, of course, me being a communications person, I was like, okay, we're on to something here, obviously, and it's time to formalize this. And because I have been handed a microphone for whatever reason, and now I've been handed a megaphone, and um, we have some important messages about empowerment and women in STEM, that if, if people are listening, let's do it, you know, for whatever reason, for whatever reason we've been given this opportunity. So um, in January 2022, I launched a website, a podcast, um, a Patreon resource to kind of support all the extra work, um, additional social media platforms, a YouTube account, kind of like all the things. Um, because I thought, well, if the media is not going to cover us, then we're going to produce our own, essentially. You know, like the mail chasers can have their content sales. We'll be over here <laughs> yeah, with our megaphone, essentially. Um, and I think it was going through all of that um, and all of the feedback coming in and input and community support and all of the other things that also then fleshed out what was actually afoot here. And so the short answer is um, it was not mail chasers. It was a vicious cycle of media and culture that had kind of created the environment that I started chasing in that was frustrating me. Um, and what I mean by that is and, and none of it was intentional, I think. And the reason the G Girls Who Chase was so instrumental and got big so quickly is because somebody raised their hand and said, everyone keeps telling me this is just the way this is. This is just the way this is. This is the way it's been for however long, 20, 30 years, as long as people have been chasing. Um, and I said, why? <laughs> like... That's ridiculous, you know, here are all these great, competent chasers out there who are being ignored and nobody knows why and nobody's doing it on purpose. So why are we, why, you know? And so I think it was that kind of collective consciousness that is what actually made the change. And so um, networks have proactively been reaching out to engage more women in their coverage. We're working with um, storm chasing content brokers, which is a thing um, that sell storm chasing footage um, to make sure that, you know, networks are getting footage from, from female chasers who weren't working with brokers previously. I mean, there's just a lot of things we're doing to kind of smooth that process out, but we interrupted the pattern of media showing storm chasing as mostly men and then culture saying, okay, storm chasing is mostly men. And then media saying, great, we're going to give culture more of what they want. So here's more men storm chasing. And now the media are saying, great, we want to show who's out there storm chasing. And it's actually a really diverse pool of people and culture saying, hey, that's awesome. How inspiring is that? And then the media is like, oh, <laughs> that's what you actually wanted. So, yeah. yeah, here we are. 
Wow. You've done so well and you can really hear in the voice there your passion for it and this kind of drive for, for changing this. And the media is a funny world. I've kind of, in my experience, I've kind of found that once I found somebody, you know, they kind of stick with them and it's often the people that have been with them for years. So if like new people are trying to get in there, it could be quite difficult. But of course, things are have changed a lot, even in the past year or two. It's, it's absolutely incredible. But I think what your story really shows is how one person with a vision, with a passion, with some fire inside of her can create something that, as you say, helps people feel this almost like inclusion and acceptance and shows the diversity of the people out there that, that do this. And then it inspires other people to do it and gives them that, you know, kind of like encouragement to say, yes, you can do this. And, you know, the photography world as well, you know, linking into the imagery that you take, you know, when we speak about photography as well, when it comes to, to weather, nature and the landscape photography, you know, for so many years, this been mostly males that have have done it and you know me on YouTube like when I began my YouTube channel I think I was one of the only women in the world doing landscape photography and thankfully there's a few more now but it's still massively underrepresented and to be fair it's not actually something I think about that much and I'm not really sure why I just think for me I have this drive and this goal to help people see the more well-being elements, I think, of photography. And this, I just feel like my mission here on, on Earth is to inspire people to connect with nature, to improve their well-being. And that's kind of like my mission. But your mission here is um, on a huge scale in many respects. And I love the um, the support and that that you've had and the amount of people that have, have come along and, yeah, supported you and got involved. It's amazing. You know, the saying goes, if you can see it, you can be it. And I think that's the key here. Um, and it is a similar instance in photography. And there's a lot of cultural overlaps, I think, in between storm chasing and photography in a lot of different ways. And I think what you describe is exactly the environment I stepped into, which is, yep, I'm just one of the only women and I never really thought about it. And this is just the way it is, you know, and most of the time that's that's fine. You know, like, and I think it's, it's, it is great for you to not feel limited by that in any way. It just is what it is. Um, but at the same time, for example, with storm chasing, you know, if you were to ask someone who their role model was in for women in storm chasing, the answer is inevitably the character Joe from the movie Twister, um, which, you know, is kind of an iconic, um, storm chasing movie that came out in 1996. And so Joe, Joe's character is now 27 years old and she's not real. <laughs> and so when you think about representation for women in STEM and in particular, um, women doing field work and doing things that I would say are badass. I mean, this, this does fall in that category as does lots of landscape photography, that's where the distinction gets made. Um, and it's, while it's certainly great to see women in lab coats doing research, it's not as visually striking as a woman standing in front of a tornado. It just is what it is. Um, and so I think that's part of why this has taken off the way it has as well, is because the output is not a spreadsheet filled with numbers. It's intense footage of severe weather that people can relate to because everybody has weather, regardless of whether it's severe, right? It's something that we all, it's part of our daily lives. And so that's what changes the scale and the uh, barrier to entry relative to belonging in a space, mm. in, in my opinion. Yeah, it's amazing. And, you know, the power of video and photography, as you rightly say, you know, seeing a woman in front of a tornado it's and you know it's just like wow even just a tornado you know, all of it is just so like wow I think the beauty I guess if we look at the positives of things like social media the more of us then that use it for positive reasons as well it, um you know the the impact that can have is is amazing and you know we'd mentioned a little bit there about about photography so obviously now you you go out and you photograph and film a lot of these storms that you're out chasing so how is your kind of relationship with photography how does it help you you to really connect with the incredible scenes that are going on around you? I'm like a details person. And I think the, the thing that makes storm photography, 
go viral the way it does is you just you get these very powerful photos of tornadoes or supercells or bolts of lightning that just in and of themselves are stunning and amazing because capturing weather is amazing. And I have developed uh, more of a sense of, like I love juxtaposing really happy benign things with storms because I love the clashing of dark and light. For me, it's kind of fascinating or some random detail about the photo that you probably would miss if you didn't look more closely. And so if you're scrolling, if you're the kind of person that scrolls, um, you're probably going to scroll past a lot of my photos because sometimes they'll have tornadoes in them, right? Or powerful storms. And every now and then it's just like, here's a picture of a supercell because holy cow. Um, but It is not the kind of like social media viral, I think, that people would look for in storm photography. And it's been interesting as I've evolved as a photographer over the years and gotten a better sense of what compositions feel right to me because, and I can tell that I've nailed it um, because what happens now is I will post a photo and immediately somebody will buy a print. Um, and it doesn't happen every time, but it has happened a lot this year. Um, and I haven't posted very many photos and the ones I have posted have that juxtaposition or have that tiny detail, or there's something about the composition that makes it perfect in some way. Um, and so an example of that is I was on a a cyclic supercell that produced nobody's really in agreement about this, somewhere between seven and nine tornadoes (laughs) in Wyoming this year. And one of my bucket list shots has been to get a tornado with a field of flowers. (laughs) Because for me, flowers very much represent that kind of happy, benign, um, almost naivete um, in photography. And then you have like a finger of God, right? Like the the essence of darkness um, kind of lurking behind it. And um, I just, it, it was just pure luck uh, the way it's set up. And um, it's, it'll, pro- I've been long look waiting for the thing that's going to become a giant metal print on my wall. And I think that's probably the one. Um, and I posted it and had a sale within 24 hours and it was not a giant, here's a giant picture of a tornado. The tornado is actually probably like an eighth of the photo itself. Um, The flowers are in the foreground, right? And so in a way you could almost miss it. (laughs) Um, So I think that for whatever reason, that capturing of the clash between um, what I call uh, finding grace and fury is the best way that I can put it. And that is, you know, there's always something beautiful to be found in darkness, essentially. And sometimes darkness threatens to overtake, but there's always that little ray of light to show us the way or to show us that we're on the right path or that things are going to be okay in the end. And so I think that's now that people are buying prints, it's not, I don't take these photos for people to buy prints. I take them to share that energy. And the buying of the prints tells me that people are making that connection, that the right people have found the me. And it's not about the viral or the number of likes or right. And that I can be satisfied with that work I'm producing. Um, I think on the flip side, I am still, so the, the hard part about storm chasing is these are very fleeting moments. I mean, first you have to get there, then you have to have a decent foreground, which is often not the case. Like tornadoes really like to come down in front of feed lots <laughs> or like some horrible, right. Where you're just like, I can't even take a picture of this because it's so awful. Um, You don't get to choose, right, where tornadoes come down. You don't get to set up a composition. And so everything is being done on the fly. You have and sometimes 
you've got 30 seconds before you have to get back in the car. You cannot set up with a tripod. You can't focus stack, right? You just don't have time for all of that. Um, and you just have to make it work such as it is. And so because of that, I haven't had a lot of time to practice my photography. And so I do think I went about it the right way in that I started chasing first. So I built the storm chasing side and then started with photography, which is a completely separate learning curve in a lot of ways. If I had tried to do both of those at the same time, I probably would have done both poorly. <laughs> um, and I often liken it to driving where, you know, you start out and there's a lot too much data, right? You don't, you don't quite know whether your foot's on the gas or the brake, where the other cars are in traffic, um, how to merge. And then the more you drive, the more it be, just becomes autopilot, right? Your body knows what to do. You don't have to think about every single little element. And that has become the case mostly with chasing for me, but definitely not with photography. And so I can often be found in front of a tornado shouting, don't screw this up. <laughs> don't screw this up. Make sure it's in focus. Don't, you know, um, I had, I, I had the opportunity to fly over an erupting volcano, uh, in December, which was an amazing life experience. And I have never been in a helicopter, much less over an erupting volcano, much less trying to shoot photos out of a helicopter. And so for someone like me, who is still very much, I would say a newbie in photography, that was overwhelming. Um, and so the empowering piece of it for me is figuring out how to get great photos in all of these different situations over which you have very little control and very little time to practice. Um, in addition to actually producing an image that connects with people and tells the story that you're wanting to tell, I think is, is that's kind of been my journey in all of this is, is figuring out all of these things while still not underexposing things and making sure it's in focus. And sometimes it's not like I'm still screwing up photos that same day that I had the seven or eight tornadoes. My first third of the day was slightly out of focus because I was like, oh my gosh, there's tornadoes <laughs> and I haven't seen them in a long time. So um, the whole thing is kind of a work in progress. But as of this year, I feel like I ha I'm finally getting close. Mm. It's amazing. So when you look at your images, you would never think that you consider yourself as a beginner. And I think I think for me, the main message in there is if you're really passionate about something, you have gone out there and learned about your subject matter before you start getting involved with photography, the imagery becomes so much easier and more natural to us. Like, I, I'm, I mean, I guess in my journey, I'm only feeling like I'm really starting to understand my photography now, but I began in very traditional landscape photography and I, I started landscape photography after almost a year of just watching the sunset and it was learning the, the sun setting, where it sets, the difference in the tides of the sea at that time of day, the colour, the clouds, looking at all of these things. But then when I eventually picked up my first camera, Things like composition and that came so easily to me because I already understood my subject matter. Um, so there's a good advice there for anybody that's maybe quite new to photography or considering getting into it. It's like, what what really excites you and what are you passionate about? And learn about that subject, I guess, first. And then when you do bring photography into it, it's just so much easier. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that is actually like, I think that's absolutely at the core of all of this. Um because you've already figured out what, you're, what story you're telling in a way. That narrative already exists in your mind. You already know what should be in focus and what shouldn't because that's what your eye is seeing, literally. And just to end, you, you say that your, your, your personal mission is to empower people to be and do what they love, which of course goes back to what we discussed earlier. So I guess it would be lovely to end on that really positive note. Is there anything else you'd like to say about this, about your personal mission and for anybody out there that's kind of struggling to pursue the thing they love in life? What advice would you give them before we, before we round up? There are so many reasons we can give ourselves that life throws at us that are narratives that we internalize over the course of our lives about why we can't do something. And they drown out all the reasons why we could. 
And it's time to prioritize. Life is too short to carry on with those stories because then all you have when you get to your deathbed is reasons why you couldn't do something. And I have become an advocate of failure. And I know that sounds insane because failure sucks. (laughs) But what I mean by that is your choice when you strike out on something is either regret, failure, or success. Those are, those are your options. And failure means that you tried. Regret is the thing to me that I never want to have again for one reason or another. We don't strike out on something because we fear failure. And it's going to happen. It's going to happen even if you never leave the house because that's just how life is. And so if we can normalize failing and normalize the, the ups and downs of progressing forward with a thing that you're passionate about and recognize that that's going to be just part of the story, but that what comes after that is a true connection to the thing that you love the most and uh, the opportunity in whatever that looks like for you to do the thing that truly makes your insides light up, then it's worth all the rest of the trouble, basically. And Girls Who Chase, of course, is about storm chasing, but it's kind of not about storm chasing. It's about whatever that thing is that lights you up inside. And you know what that is. People know, even the folks who feel like, I don't know what that is, you do. (laughs) It's buried under all the reasons why you can't or shouldn't or you're avoiding what comes after, which might not be the outcome that you're looking for. So I want everyone to know that any, the first step brings the rest of the journey. The hardest step is the first step. And yeah, you can absolutely do anything you want. And I am living proof of that. Wow. Wow. What a powerful uh, message to end this, Jen. That's just incredible. Thank you so much for your time today. I think there's a lot in this that that will empower people, that will inspire people. Maybe you'll get some more people interested in storm chasing as well. Who knows? Mm -hmm. Um, But I think the main message here is that empowerment, that inspiration and that message of, you know, whatever it is in life that you want to do, you know, try your best to to pursue it and to, I guess, work through your struggles and your limiting beliefs and, and you know, really pursue that that inner dream and that inner knowing that you have because you never know where it's going to take you. And it's such an incredible release when when you get there. It's it's amazing. Um, so for those who really resonated with your story today or would like to, to follow along with, with Girls Who Chase, where can they go to find you? Oh, for sure. And thank you so much again for having me and letting me tell my story. I am on Instagram at, uh, under Jen Walton Chases and um, on Twitter, me, Jen Walton. That is where a lot of my storm chasing kind of day to day goes. And then um, and photography and prints, Jennifer A. Walton dot com. Girls Who Chase is Twitter and Instagram under the handle Girls Who Chase and www.girlswhochase.com and Obviously, we'd love to see you online if you're a woman getting into storm chasing or you like capturing clouds in your landscape photography. We'd love to have you. So definitely come come check us out. Brilliant. Fantastic. And I'll put a link to all of those in, in the show notes below. So brilliant, Jen. Thank you so much again for your time. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to this week's podcast. It really does mean the world to me. And now that this podcast has come to an end, there's only one thing left for you to do. It's time to pick up your camera and head outdoors. There's so many incredible photographic opportunities just waiting for you to discover.